big guns, 20 kilometer snipers, the hammer on the battlefield, the stuff of nightmares for enemy troops. Today, artillery is far more than big guns. Close air support, unmanned aerial vehicles, intelligence gathering, counter battery, targeting. Modern artillery is one of the most decisive elements of contemporary land combat. Artillery is the king of battle. Ready, set, Canadian Forces Base Wainwright, training ground of warriors. It's 620 square kilometers of training area used for live fire artillery, armored, and infantry training. This is where the Canadian Army does some of its toughest work, preparing soldiers to meet any threat, to win in battle, to survive combat. It's October, and the base is a beehive of activity. Soldiers from the Royal 22nd Regiment, commonly known as the Vandus, are here conducting advanced maneuver training. Based in Valcarche, Quebec, they're here because of what the base can offer. Large firing ranges, dedicated training staff, simulated warfare that goes 24 hours a day in virtually any weather or condition. This is real training for serious deployments. And the Van Dues have a reason for taking this seriously. They're preparing for future deployment to Afghanistan. They have to get this right. Lives depend on it. One of the units training with the Van Dues from Valcartier is the 5 RALC, known as Le 5 Regiment d'Artillerie Légère du Canada. They are the supporting artillery unit. It's their job to protect the infantry and armor in combat. Protect them through accurate and superior firepower. It's a big responsibility. Artillery is making a big difference in Afghanistan. These gunners understand that. Major Warren Smith is the battery commander with the 5 RALC. He is an officer with a wealth of experience and training. He explained a little bit about what their role is on the battlefield and why they're here at CFB Wainwright. Artillery in the Army is used to, uh, to provide the, uh, the, the all-arms team. It provides fire support, uh, suppression and uh, neutralization of an objective uh, while the maneuver elements maneuver into position and close with and destroy the enemy. It inflicts damage and casualties on the enemy and also keeps the enemy's head down during an advance of friendly forces. That's in the offensive. And in the defensive, it can uh, it can uh, break up uh, break up enemy advances and uh, prevent and uh, inflict damage and casualties on the enemy during their advance. Well, it's important for us as gunners to uh, to practice uh, live firing a great deal. In fact, almost every time that we do go out on an exercise, it is live firing, uh, and that's in the interest of uh, of honing skills, honing drills, and in the the search of perfection in order to make sure that we can bring in our fire support as close to um, the supported arm maneuvering, moving on the ground, the infantry and the armor, um, as possible to, uh, to cover that young, young frightened man who's advancing on the battlefield and to bring him in as close as possible to prevent the enemy from engaging him until he's in range to engage the enemy. The goal of 5 RALC is to provide close artillery support on the battlefield. Its tactical title 
is danger close. Translation, putting high explosive shells within 300 meters of friendly troops. That's close, real close. So the firing has to be precise and exact. There's no room for error in combat. But there are concerns about the abilities of all the soldiers that have come to Wainwright. Many are new, untested, with little real training. That's why they've come here, to be trained, to be tested. The time for mentoring has come for everyone. Uh, down to 339 meters, only mounted. There is nothing dismounted. Therefore, if they It's late afternoon on a beautiful October day. For CMTC staff, it's just the beginning of what will be a series of non-stop exercises over the next few weeks. Their goal is to professionally train the young soldiers from the Royal 22nd Regiment. The Royal 22nd has been tasked with securing a mock Afghan village. The objectives are real. However, there are concerns about the soldiers' abilities. Many are new recruits with little training and no field experience. It's a time for truth. These are live fire exercises, real bullets. This is a platoon objective, so there's two possible entrances. First of all, all of what I'm gonna tell you is gonna be explained in the safety briefing. This for these soldiers, candor and honesty are the basis of everything they do. This is critical in combat. Now, I need an honest assessment here, and I asked it last night, but really, what is the state of their close quarter battle technique, drills, capability? Because I've heard some not, disturbing... It's not very good. Okay. It's not very First good. of all, as part of the safety briefing, there will be no automatic fire on this range entering building. For the gunners of 5 RALC, it's the same. They have new soldiers, new young officers. They need to practice and hone their skills. Accuracy and precision are decisive on the battlefield. It wasn't always that way. In the First World War, artillery was one of the most dominant weapon systems on the battlefield. The Germans invented indirect fire, which allowed artillery to shoot at distant, unseen targets. Everyone quickly copied them. Each side built up huge masses of guns all with the single purpose of hammering their enemy into submission. Accuracy was only of moderate interest. The key was to put as many artillery shells on your enemy as quickly as possible. Today, accuracy and precision are everything. Artillery batteries have to be able to lay down a barrage of deadly fire close to friendly forces. Very close. As combat in Afghanistan is proving, so they have to get it right every time. The infantry depend on them. <laughs> Lieutenant Alexander Dufour is a recce officer with the 5 RALC. He understands the importance of precision and what the consequences will be if there are mistakes. Mistakes cost lives, even in exercises. Basically put, why it's so important when we're doing danger close is that you have live troops at the end. Usually when we fire missions, we fire in an impact area that has nobody that could be eight kilometers wide. So if there's an error, it's serious, but you're not gonna be killing anybody. We have a, sa a safety officer that will calculate the elevations and the bearings and ricochet, and he will say that the rounds are safe. However, if you have live troops at the end, the safety is even more intense and the drills that we do here on the guns and at the director are double and triple check to make sure that there's no possible error because we're gonna be firing at 800 meters uh, dismounted and 300 meters mounted. So you can imagine just here uh, what those rounds are gonna be like at the other end so there can be no room for error and that's why everything's gonna be double checked and triple checked if we have to. When we're doing danger close, there's no room for error because if we make errors, people are gonna die at the end. Canadian Forces Base Gagetown in New Brunswick, home of the Army Combat Training Center. The artillery school is located within this facility. This is where gunners are trained for future deployments. This is where they learn about precision in everything they do. 
Captain David Grebstad is an experienced artillery officer who instructs at the artillery school. He explained how artillery divides into separate branches based on differing technologies, where precision is critical. There are three streams in the artillery, the uh, surveillance and target acquisition, field artillery, and air defense. Those three streams have uh, various different responsibilities on the battlefield. The uh, surveillance and target acquisition, the STA gunners, uh, they're responsible for uh, observing the enemy, uh, trying to find the enemy and using various different resources such as sound ranging, uh, UAVs, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles and uh, weapon locating radar to try to identify uh, enemy assets. The field artillery uh, uses howitzers and uh, they employ indirect fire, uh, high explosives, uh, smoke, uh, different sorts of munitions to uh, support the maneuver arms, the infantry and the armored, in achieving their goal. The air defense, uh, they are they're primarily tasked with uh, keeping any enemy aircraft, uh, helicopters or uh, fast aircraft such as jets, uh, bombers, uh, from interfering in our operations and providing a, an umbrella of coverage so that we can conduct our operations without having to worry about the enemy's aircraft interfering with us. The Army has realized again how important we are. The artillery has always been extremely important on the battlefield and it may, for a long period, it may not have been apparent with uh, peacekeeping operations where the lethality and the combat power that uh, the artillery brings to the fore wasn't really uh, required under those circumstances. But now that we, uh, we are conducting combat operations, uh, we are realizing what, uh, what has always been, is that the artillery is a battle-winning force that really sets the conditions for success for all the arms on the battlefield. I think one of the biggest effects that artillery will have on an enemy is, number one, is there, there's nothing they can do about it. Uh, an enemy soldier, if he's being shelled by, uh, by our artillery, has no means to actually do something about it other than to run away. Uh, artillery will isolate a soldier from his chain of command. It will keep him uh, hunkered down in a bunker or, or in a trench, unable to move, to uh, be resupplied, to get food. It will uh, make the enemy soldier feel lonely and uh, despair for his own condition. Psychological effects of artillery fire are absolutely devastating for someone who does not have any recourse to do anything about it. Artillery has evolved a great deal in the last 10 years. Modern technology has changed howitzers into precision weapon systems. Systems that can reach out to 40 kilometers and hit a target within 10 meters. Now, there's nowhere to hide. When we return, artillery on the modern battlefield. Light Howitzer, LG-1 Mark II, 105 millimeters. Designed to support highly mobile forces. Maximum effective range, 19 kilometers. Maximum rate of fire, 12 rounds per minute. The last five years have seen a dramatic change in the missions and equipment of the Royal Canadian Artillery. For decades, the M109 tracked gun system, which featured the deadly and powerful 155mm howitzer, was the backbone of the artillery. Now, this system has been put into reserve. The 105mm towed howitzer, which was the artillery's light mobile support system, is potentially being phased out. Even the Air Defense Regiment had retired the twin 35mm Orlikon anti-aircraft system, but these changes were for good reasons. Recent combat experience in both peacekeeping and peacemaking operations have highlighted the need for changes. New equipment, new tactics, big changes. The Commandant of the Army's Artillery School is Lieutenant Colonel Brian McPherson. He's a veteran who clearly understands what all this new equipment will mean to soldiers in the battlefield. Our role has never changed. Um, however, in, uh, in, the, in the 90s, there wasn't much, uh, much cause for, uh, for guns to be firing in support of our comrades during the, uh, uh, the peacekeeping operations in Bosnia and Somalia. However, uh, with, the, uh, with the operations that are going on in Afghanistan, the artillery uh, is playing uh, the key role that it always once did in, in support of the infantry armor in the fight. With the recent arrival of the M777-155 howitzer and other uh, capabilities such as our, uh, our mini UAVs, and the locating equipment that we've got, the acoustic weapon locating system, and our most recent arrival, uh, the uh, light counter mortar radar 
These bring capabilities to the combined arms team that have never been seen before and, uh, and really, really enhance our effectiveness on the battlefield. We've had uh, a 155 caliber in the, uh, in, in the artillery for, for many years and uh, that was with the M109. Uh, most recently we received the M777 which is simply a fantastic howitzer. Uh, that combined with the digital gun management uh, system that is put on there, it uh, enhances its effectiveness and accuracy and precision, uh, thus providing it a, a, a capability that we can use in a contemporary operating environment amongst civilians uh, such as we see in Afghanistan today. The latest gun the artillery has acquired is the M777 produced by BAE Systems. This gun has already been deployed by the Canadian Army to Afghanistan. Range 24 kilometers. Rate of fire, six rounds per minute. Extended range with guided munitions, 40 kilometers. This system is very light and mobile, capable of being airlifted, towed, or carried in planes. It is helping win the war in Afghanistan. While most of the artillery units in the Army await the new M777 howitzers, they continue to train on the venerable 105 millimeter. This gun has won the admiration of gunners throughout the world for its ease of use, simplicity, and lethality. Second Lieutenant Natasha Skidmore of 5 RALC told us how this system works. This is a 105 uh, howitzer. It's uh, towed. I'm going to explain the different parts and what they're used for. This is the barrel. Uh, inside the barrel, you can see the rifling on the inside, which isn't as evident with most arms, but you can really see it. Helps with accuracy and also the range. This is uh, part of the recoil system, which uh, takes a lot of, when we're firing such high caliber rounds, it takes a lot of the stress off the gun and a lot of the components by using it. These are the trails here. You can see the other one over there. Um, this is the tannoy box, and this is how we communicate. We string up a wire to the box to our command post, and all the orders for the guns with the bearings and elevations, um, all the different, the different things we can do with the gun are issued through the box, and it's a little loudspeaker everyone can hear. This is the lunette, which with we, uh, when we close the trails, we can tow the howitzer. Um, this is the breech. We insert the rounds here. We use the pull cord to fire. Uh, these wheels adjust the elevation of the gun and also the bearing. We apply numbers on the sight, level the bubbles, and we're ready to fire. The pace of training at Wainwright is intensifying every day, day and night. The soldiers are on the ranges firing their weapons, going through their drills ensuring they know their jobs. Everything has to work perfectly on the big day. Even the artillery is busy practicing. No one is idle. They run through drills and practice setting up the battery in new locations. This is known as shoot and scoot, or quick action. The purpose is simple, to avoid counter-battery fire. That's why the gun teams constantly practice firing and moving. You have to get a gun team well-versed in the drills if you're going to be quick. Master Warrant Officer Jean Lavaille is the senior NCO with 5 RALC on this exercise. He explained what the composition of a typical gun crew is. You have a number one, which is the detachment commander on, on the gun. Uh, normally, uh, it's seven members. Uh, you have a number one, the second in command, which we call them the, the 2IC, and then five uh, gunners that are working on the ammunition, helping uh, on recording the gun. So it's a seven-gun detachment. Right now in Kandahar, there, there are ten because they're working on a different gun we have here. Uh, so they have ten members, uh, which is three more than we have now. Therefore, like I said, you have the number one detachment commander. They all work together, but he's the main man on the gun. So, how do artillery rounds work? And what are the different types of shells? How has technology improved artillery shells? It's the ammunition that artillery fires that makes it so deadly on the battlefield. 
From high explosive airburst shells to illumination rounds that turn night into day, artillery ammunition is designed to carry out both offensive and defensive missions. There are three basic types of artillery shells and fuses used today. The first is a proximity fused round. These are meant to burst above troops and light armored vehicles. These shells dispense a large amount of shrapnel into the air. The shrapnel, which is literally fragments of the artillery bullet, will cut down attacking troops or send them seeking shelter. The second is known as point detonation. These bullets are fused to explode on contact with the ground or targets. The third type is known as delay. This allows the bullet to dig into the ground slightly before exploding. This allows for greater damage on hard contacts or shelters. To learn more about artillery rounds, we went to the Canadian Artillery School in Gagetown. Warrant Officer Rene Parker explained more about artillery shells and what types there are. Your high explosive projectile uh, used for uh, blast or fragmentation defeats uh, solid objects, building structures, soft skinned vehicles and light armored vehicles. The fragmentation or the breaking up of the projectile is good for uh, any personnel. We can uh, make it impact and detonate on impact in which the blast and fragmentation will defeat uh, solid objects and of course kick up a lot of dirt, send shrapnel several hundred meters injuring personnel. We can also make this uh, an airburst projectile and in that case using a time or electronic fuse we can allow it to detonate approximately 12 meters in the air sending the blast and fragmentation down to the ground and very effective against uh, personnel in the open. The 105 millimeter smoke projectile is a projectile used for screening uh, friendly movement and uh, blinding the enemy. And how it operates, it's an airburst projectile which has cylinders like this one here that when detonated in the air will be pushed out the back of the projectile, they will be ignited, fall to the ground and they will produce a smoke element for approximately 90 seconds. The illuminating projectile used for lighting up the night sky gives us the capability, if we're not using our night vision devices, to put a basically a light in an area so we can see. And how it operates is when the uh, fuse functions, it'll send the charge into the uh, main canister, kicking out the uh, parachute and the cylinder, lighting up the cylinder on its exit, and the parachute will deploy, and the, the illuminate candle or will float to the ground uh, slowly and burns approximately 450,000 candle power for about one minute. This can light up an area approximately 800 meters in diameter. Your high explosive squash head projectile, uh, like this one here, is used to defeat armor. Uh, 105 millimeter in diameter and it's used at a very high velocity, very low trajectory. We basically want to put it on the side of the uh, armored vehicle. And how it, ha how it operates is uh, when it strikes the armored vehicle, the, the body will crush against the side of the vehicle and a base detonating fuse will detonate the main charge, forcing the charge or the blast against the side of the vehicle. And inside the vehicle, pieces will break apart, uh, moving at a very high velocity inside the vehicle, uh, killing the enemy and uh, breaking up equipment in the vehicle, disabling it. So right here, we have the uh, propellant for the 105 millimeter howitzer. How the howitzer, 105 millimeter howitzer works is the, the casing is used to house the propellant. In the middle of the casing, we have an igniter. And simply put, the casing is mated to the projectile with the appropriate charge to send the round down to the appropriate range. Uh, maximum charge for maximum range. And if we take charges out, we can reduce the range, whatever is ordered from the command post. The casing is then mated to the projectile and the projectile is loaded into the chamber of the howitzer. On the order of fire, the firing pin will strike the base of the projectile, igniting the propellant charges, which in turn will create a lot of gas, which will push on the end of the projectile or the base of the projectile. This in turn will send the projectile up the barrel. The rotating band will be in groove into the lands and grooves, which are machined in the howitzer, causing the projectile to spin, enabling it to uh, cut the atmospheric conditions and accurately reach its target. 
Excalibur is the latest generation of ammunition for artillery. It has a GPS guidance system and can be fired at ranges up to 40 kilometers from a target. Best of all, it will hit a target within less than 10 meters at that range. Now artillery can be used in urban settings where accuracy must be exact. For enemy troops or terrorists, this means there's no more hiding. This is the long-range sniper bullet that packs a punch. The artillery has two specialized personnel trained to work with forward maneuver groups. The first is known as a FAC, or forward air controller. They control any type of aircraft, from attack helicopters to fighter jets. Their job is to get ordnance onto targets. The second is a FU, or forward observation officer. These specialists control the fall of artillery shells and even missiles onto targets. Their accuracy is paramount. The use of air power in combined arms operations dates back to World War II, when the Germans perfected the Blitzkrieg. Today, it's called CAS, or Close Air Support. Captain Derek Crabb is with the Royal Canadian Horse Artillery. He has seen a lot in his 14 years of service, including time as a FAC. His next mission is Afghanistan. Today, He's training students how to control fighter jets to drop bombs on target. He explained what forward air controllers do. A forward air controller is, or FAC as we uh, call them, is essentially uh, normally a two-man party or two-soldier party that effectively uh, coordinates any fixed wing or aviation assets uh, to strike at enemy targets. So if you could think of uh, essentially anything that flies, whether it's an attack helicopter or an A-10 or a Canadian Forces Hornet, that's their job is to uh, essentially coordinate them with all the other ground fires as well as directing them onto the, the, the strike point or the target. There's a tremendous amount of coordination that has to be done prior to the actual strike. So what Ford Air Controllers do and, and part of their biggest responsibility other than the actual strike itself, which is obviously the most uh, important part and, and training the most uh, uh, exciting and fun part, is all the detailed coordination that happens before that. So the uh, determination of where the friendlies are, having the situational awareness to understand where your forward line of own troops is when you're under fire can be difficult. In the Canadian Forces, uh, we typically have sergeants and above as forward air controllers and it's usually a mix of both NCOs and officers. But ideally, you're looking for the same sort of uh, qualities in, in these individuals. And that is someone who's uh, very proficient with their own basic tactics, their own movement, uh, survivability on the battlefield. So someone who's able to basically take care of themselves in a uh, pretty, pretty uh, harsh environment. That's the first thing. The next thing is someone who's able to uh, be able to think on their feet and react to the uh, a changing situation. Because as opposed to ground forces, uh, air forces are able to move much faster than us. They can see a lot more because they're up in the air. And so what we thought might be a good plan, uh, we have to be very flexible in achieving our mission, uh, but being able to react to the lightning pace that an air element can move, move at. Uh, so that's probably the second thing. And then the third thing is, uh, having probably the three-dimensional ability to view the battlefield uh, so that you can understand that uh, army folks are used to working in two dimensions where we you know, are looking across the battlefield at the target. Well, that's considerably different when you're looking at it from the pilot's perspective who's up in the air. So being able to uh, think in terms of what the pilot is able to see, to be able to talk that pilot onto the target, and to be able to think of how the aircraft is going to attack from that third dimension is also a critical element of, of what makes, makes a good forward air controller. Captain Nick Williams is a FAC instructor at the artillery school in Gagetown. Every day, he's training new FAC students on this important warfare discipline. He drills into students' heads why it's important for them to be precise with the directions to air assets under their control. All right, gentlemen, 
There's another point that, uh, that is uh, keenly, keenly interjected in this, in this point in our demonstration. It's the effects that are produced by the munitions that you drop or assist in the dropping of from the aircraft. In this specific example, you're dropping uh, bombs on two tanks located about uh, 100 meters to the west of a small village. Well, associated with that small village are what you would expect, the civilian population, perhaps other friendly forces, and as a result, it's, it is exceptionally important that we understand the effects of collateral damage. There's an effect that we have to achieve with that munition on the ground, whether that be to neutralize the target, to destroy it, or to temporarily suppress it. We have to do that in such a way that we ensure that we cause as little damage to the civilian population or infrastructure as possible. It all falls in line with the overarching theme of the hearts and minds. By damaging their homes, by destroying their homes, we, we have certain impacts on the overall theater campaign, which you and I don't want to be responsible for. So it's important that you consider how large is the bomb I'm going to drop, what effect is that going to have on the town, and what other decisions that may force you to make. Is it necessary to drop a bomb when perhaps using the main gun on the airplane would, would do better and cause less damage? So right from the start of your training, we want to make it an ingrained part of your thought process to consider at all times the aspects of collateral damage and how you, as the FAC on the battlefield, can mitigate those effects. Well, at the end of the day, being a FAC is, uh, is an incredibly exciting job. There is no other individual on the battlefield who has the capability to bring as much firepower to bear. Uh, that is a heady responsibility and one that most of us uh, appreciate fully. Uh, when they need someone to come with a little bit of clout to, uh, to put the enemy in his place, they come to the fact first and foremost. And to be the man or the woman on the battlefield that has that power, it's just plain good. Forward observation officers are the artillery's eyes and ears on the battlefield. They help the battle commander decide what to target and how. If they make a mistake, it can cost lives. The pressures are enormous. They're on the front line in the thick of combat. So it takes a special soldier to do this type of work. At the artillery school in Gagetown, They've created a simulator that helps train junior forward observation officers. Captain Kathy Hare is the senior instructor at the simulator. She talked about how it works and why it's important for training forward observation officers. End of mission of BTRs, a destroyed and burning over. Uh, this morning we were, the facility we were in was the indirect fire trainer and that was the forward observation officer course and uh, they're training to be uh, forward observation officers. Many of them already are planning to go on various task forces uh, and deploy within Afghanistan within the next year, probably. The FU is uh, an integral part of the, the all-arms team or uh, integrated within a maneuver element. So they will be the, the actual officer is responsible to advise the supported arms commander on use of all indirect fire, not just uh, specifically artillery, but they'll also advise on uh, use of uh, close air support, uh, attack helicopters, any, any uh, type of indirect fire that might be available to them on the battlefield. Naval gunfire if uh, we're in a, in a position where we might have naval gunfire support as well. Okay, the uh, indirect fire trainer, it's a, a computer simulation system and we can, we can replicate various settings within, uh, we have various different map settings, uh, most of the bases within the United States we have different maps for them and as well uh, various settings here within uh, Gagetown so we can replicate various training environments and uh, the, the students can actually go through the exact procedure for the call for fire. We can also include uh, close air support in that so they can uh, start to train on the deconfliction of the close air support included in, uh, in their fire plans once we get to that uh, level. So it, uh, it, it simulates exactly uh, time of flights and, and everything very realistically as to what the, the gun's w response would be. And as well, it also replicates um, uh, realistic target effects on, on various uh, types of targets that, that we may encounter out there. Uh, it further can 
Uh, if we put them in a setting in an urban area, it can also replicate the uh, collateral damage that would be done to buildings if they, if they accidentally engage the building or uh, engage friendly forces. So it's, it's pretty realistic. It gives us uh, good feedback. And uh, now we have an instructor module that can even give us further feedback as to, as to how they're performing. The, the foo is a key uh, player in within the uh, maneuver element, whether it's uh, with the infantry or the armored. They're the key advisor for them on all indirect fire, uh, both lethal and non-lethal, and uh, are responsible in the end for uh, bringing fire to bear on, on enemy or potentially warning uh, enemy if we're using non-lethal means to, to achieve some other effect. STA. It stands for Surveillance, Targeting, and Acquisition. It's one of the most important tasks of the artillery, yet it's the least known. STA is making a huge difference in Afghanistan, where intelligence on the Taliban is helping save soldiers' lives. Captain Richard Little is the senior STA instructor at the artillery school in Gagetown. He described what STA is and why it's so important on the battlefield. STA is a short form for surveillance and target acquisition. Within the broader scope of uh, what we do in military operations, we have something we call ISTAR, which is Intelligence, Surveillance, Target Acquisition, and Reconnaissance. And STA is the artillery portion of it for surveillance, finding out where the enemy is, monitoring areas, and target acquisition, actively seeking out specific targets for, uh, for uh, engagement. The reason uh, STA has become important as, as of recent years is that traditionally and historically, if you go back to the Cold War, we knew who we were fighting, we knew how they operated, we knew where they were going to operate and how they are going to fight us. After the fall of the wall, as things started to get a little bit more uh, nebulous going into the Balkans or into uh, parts of the world where we didn't concentrate before, the enemy came a little bit harder to identify and we need to get at the take advantage of our technological abilities, get surveillance and target acquisition systems out there to better help identify where these guys are. In our current situation in Afghanistan, uh, we're using STA highly, uh, more often than not, as a force protection in order to be able to identify the people as they're starting to come towards us to, uh, to protect us so that we can do our job over there. STA works principally as a keyed sensor. We, uh, somebody will have an idea of where, it's, where we're supposed to be looking at a certain time. As you can well appreciate, if you have soldiers up 24 hours looking at the same spot, you get a little bit tired. But if you tell them between 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock something's going to happen, for that two hours they can stay focused. So someone will have, uh, for whatever reason, a reason for us to look into an area. We will deploy our sensors to a certain area, look into that area, and try to detect what it is that we want to get. So we're cued by, uh, by events or by plans, and we execute uh, our, our surveillance plan in accordance with that. We are deploying systems to Afghanistan, and one of them is the hostile artillery locator, we call it HALO. Another one is the uh, lightweight counter mortar radar, we call it the LCMR. And the other one is the Skylark, which is a mini unmanned aircraft. Those systems will be used as part of the, an integrated force protection structure, as well as a, perhaps a, the, the UAV, the unmanned aircraft, is a bit different in the fact that we can actually go out seeking things. But the weapon locating radar and the, uh, the uh, halo, the acoustic system, will be there to detect people shooting against us. We'll be able to tell where they've shot from and we'll be able to take appropriate act uh, actions after that. The big advantage of flying a UAV in places such as Afghanistan is, the, is it helps eliminate areas where we do not need to go. If we're looking to go through a vineyard, if you, if you didn't have the view from the air, you'd have to basically spread yourselves out in an extended line and walk through the vineyard until you found if anybody was in there. With the UAV, with the, uh, with the sensors we have, and with the ability to fly and get a bird's eye view, we can prove, for example, that there's no one in that vineyard, therefore we don't have to walk through it. Or we can say, there's something in that vineyard, we're not sure where it is, but we know where it is, and we can take a better approach to it. And the Army today has uh, got the idea and the, and the important way of uh, operating the fact that we lead with sensors. We'd much rather lead and find out what we are going into before we actually get there. Historically, we've led with soldiers that can go out and find the enemy. Now we've got the technology and the ability to go out and lead with sensors, find out where the enemy is, and be able to engage with the enemy before 
we actually have to start putting soldiers' lives in peril. It's finally the big day. The culmination of weeks of intense training. Ammunition is loaded. Weapons are given a final check. In the early morning light, the soldiers of the Royal 22nd Regiment move into position with their light armored vehicles and prepare for their attack. Today, the artillery will support the infantry as they make an attack on a mock Afghan village. The village is being held by Taliban fighters. The targets for their guns are very close to where the soldiers will be working. Very close. The pressure for precision is exceptional. So everything must be checked, verified, and then checked again. There can be no mistakes. Mistakes will kill. Uh, ce qu'on fait présentement, c'est qu'on fait une mission de tir danger proche pour uh, appuyer uh, l'infanterie qui font une avance sur l'objectif. Ce qu'on fait présentement, vu que c'est une mission de tir danger proche, on met un peu plus de sécurité sur la, sur la pièce. Ça fait que il y a, y a, y a un, un officier de sécurité qui vérifie toutes les datas, faire sûr et certain que les, les, les lignes, les bulles et les azimuts sont bien appliqués sur la pièce, pour faire sûr que la sécurité est respectée sur la pièce. With a crack of gunfire, the attack commences. Everywhere you look, there's activity. Armored fighting vehicles attacking. Soldiers clearing houses. Artillery raining down nearby. Like an opera or stage play. This attack is beautifully orchestrated. It's all done with a single purpose to achieve the mission, to win. The artillery rounds from the 5 RELC battery are precise and accurate. They are successfully suppressing the simulated enemy forces. Forward air controllers call in a strike by CF-18s. 500-pound bombs crash into their targets. All is going as planned. They've proven they can work together. The mission is a success. Artillery, in all its capacities, has helped win this battle. Artillery has evolved a great deal from even 10 years ago. Changing demands of operations and technology have dramatically impacted the composition of the senior service of the Army. Artillery is now one of the most progressive and important combat arms in the Canadian Forces. But there's still one major reason why people join the artillery. Pride. I think uh, we're very proud of the artillery, namely because the, the, tr the history of the artillery in Canada and the history of the nation itself are intertwined. The artillery was the very first permanent force uh, army unit that was created when uh, A and B batteries were created uh, in the 1870s. And those two batteries still exist to this day, both uh, are in Shiloh, Manitoba. Uh, being that way, the, uh, the artillery, uh, being the very first uh, uh, permanent force of the military, has been involved in every single operation that the, that the Canadian Forces has been involved, both in, uh, in combat operations and in peacekeeping which is why our motto, Ubique, means everywhere. We adopted that from the British artillery, but it has just as much impact with the Canadian military as well. You, you can see the guns firing at the back. I mean, uh, it, it's uh, we're doing a teamwork. It, it's a good, uh, it's a good, well, I guess it's a good living. I've been doing it for 23 years. So uh, it's something uh, I love and I'll keep it, I'll keep doing it for the longest time, I guess. It's simply a great time to be a gunner. Uh, there are fantastic opportunities for uh, for the young uh, young Canadians of today to serve in the uh, in the army, but most specifically in the artillery. We are the only combat arms that uh, that have uh, that has received a uh, whole new suites of equipment that I've alluded to the the M triple seven howitzer uh, and all the uh, and all our surveillance target acquisition capabilities uh, that have recently arrived within the last two years, um, as well as uh, again 
It's, uh, we are playing a vital role in the battlefields of Afghanistan, and we will continue to do that regardless of its operations in Afghanistan or if its operations in some other part of the world where the government sends us. Uh, the fun factor is definitely uh, the big guns, and uh, it's a heck of a lot of fun, and uh, it's uh, really exciting. That's about all I can say. To be the battlefield hammer hasn't changed, and I don't see it, foresee it really changing. And really, at the end of the day, if it takes us one bullet to achieve what 50 years ago took 150 bullets, uh, you know, that's a good thing. And uh, again, with technology, that will change. However, at the end of the day, we're the battlefield hammer, and uh, I don't think that'll ever change. We want you in the artillery. We want you in the artillery. <laughs>